You may look at some countries and think that they're poor because they were dealt a bad hand, whereas others you may look at and really struggle to see why they were never able to kick on. Some countries were truly blessed more than others in various ways that allowed them to become great states. But it's interesting to see that there were various others with similar characteristics that were never really able to make the most of them. The thing is, regardless of where these countries are located around the world, they all tend to share similar characteristics between them that help explain how they got to where they are. Most people could probably back themselves to have some kind of explanation and idea as to why some countries are rich, whereas others are poor. They may point to colonization, corruption, geography, or individuals through time, claiming that is the main reason that this or that country is still poor. They may point to countries in the West and say that those countries are only rich because they exploited the poor countries and extracted all their resources while having more money and military might. The thing is, if it were that easy to explain and the solutions were as straightforward as some people like to think, surely more countries would have gone ahead and actually implemented these changes and seen them work out for them. Equally, if the solutions were as non-existent and bounded by fate as others like to claim to be, there wouldn't have been examples like China, Singapore, or even Poland that have proved that it doesn't have to be the case. As a prelude to some of the deep dives that I'll be going into in this channel, covering different countries around the world and telling the story of how they got to where they are and the specific circumstances of their existence, I wanted to be able to make this video to be able to cover some of the shared experiences that poor countries have and really what it was that got them to where they are today and some of the reasons why they don't seem to be able to really break out of their current situation. If you're interested in this topic, you like this video as you go along and you want to stay up to date on some of the latest ones coming out, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to this channel as I'll bring you more value, insights and stories on the different topics of life lessons, the world, people and geopolitics moving forward. Diving straight into it, we'll be going to some of the surface level reasons that people like to point to, such as corruption, colonization and climate, as well as the deeper, more entrenched ones that poorer countries tend to share that keep them in the self-fulfilling loop of not being able to break away from their current situations. Before going into anything, it's important to remember that world history has been written for thousands of years. But at the same time, it's also important to remember that since 1960, the world GDP as a whole has grown over 70 times over. The total population in the world hit 1 billion people for the first time in 1804. And in 1960, that number had grown to 3 billion. Whereas today, we're reaching closer and closer to the 8 billion people mark. What that means above anything is that the trends of the last 200 years and especially the last 60 years will have a lot more to say about where the country is today than anything prior to that. Although the great empires of Mali, the Qing, the Egyptians and the Persians were powerhouses in their days, the legacy of colonialism, 20th century wars and recent ideologies and policies are going to be the thing that really dictates where the country is currently at. To start exploring the common experiences that shaped up how the world is like today, we can start by having a look at the three C's of colonialism, the Cold War, and corruption. Focusing on the last 200 years first, the clear elephant in the room is colonialism. Not so much to explain what it was, but more so to explain the impact it had, and specifically, the different types of colonization, as well as the different types of government structures that were put in place to actually rule these territories, which have a lot to say about where countries are at today. In the simplest terms, colonialism was essentially the practice of control by one power over a dependent area or people outside of their borders. If you look at maps of the world where Europe laid claim over, it's easy to see that the vast majority of the world had come under the influence of one power or another. So the legacies of this tends to be a defining factor for a country's current state. Primarily, there were two different types of colonies, extractive colonies and settler colonies. Extractive colonies were set up with the single goal of gathering resources to benefit the imperial center economically. There was no incentive to develop these lands or to make them anything aside from being a breadbasket of raw material. Settler colonies, meanwhile, were set up to be extensions of the homeland for the empire. Some of these, like Australia or Canada for the British, were very successful in building up the government and institutions needed to function well during and after independence, whereas others like Algeria for the French 
didn't have the same success under that status. We'll go into that in a lot more detail down the line when we speak about the deeper reasons and we look at the roles of institutions in actual nation building. The thing to keep in mind is that the colonial structures of power and government put in place tended to be carried on by the post-colonial state once it achieved its independence, which plays a large role in explaining their economies and how power is distributed within society. If we take a step back to look at the last 60 years though, you'll realize that the first half of that time and the few years prior were dominated by the Cold War. When people look at the Cold War today, they normally think of the superpower rivalry between the US and the Soviet Union, the clash of capitalism and communism, proxy wars, and the space race, which is generally the meta-narrative of how things played out in the history books. For the purpose of this exploration though, what we really need to focus on in terms of the Cold War is the term third world countries, which some people still use today to describe poorer, less developed nations. The term was first coined in 1952 by a French historian who was attempting to describe how the world had been divided after the Second World War. The first world was the capitalist nations of Europe, North America, and their allies, led by the US. The second world was the communist bloc, led by the Soviet Union, with China, Eastern Europe, and its other allies included, whereas the third world was the rest. The superpower rivalry and the fight for control around the world played out on every single continent. But the main thing that we have to look at is the implications of this. For post-colonial Africa, for example, it was often the case where the two superpowers were taking sides with different factions vying for power to replace the whole left by their colonial overlords, often arming these different groups and sometimes orchestrating instability to see their side come out on top. In what is now known as Latin America, which is another Cold War term in and of itself, the US grouped these nations as a single unit and intervened on many occasions when pro-socialist forces had any chance of coming to power, being direct supporters of keeping societies set up in the colonial structure, which made them easier to control. It was in Asia though where there was the most involvement, with Korea and Vietnam being huge battlegrounds that the Americans and Soviets found themselves in, and where the fight for influence, also heavily involving communist China, took on all kinds of dimensions. After the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, and even possibly before that in 1989, the Cold War with Russia was officially over, but its legacy still lives on to this day. If you continue the line of what it was, which is essentially great powers competing for influence and different zones of control around the world, it's easy to see that that kind of competition has never really died down. More than half of all African states are indebted to China. Russia and the US continue to be involved in the Middle East, and the post-Soviet territories around Russia continue to be a battleground where some countries are defined by their relations to either the East or the West. Finally, the last of the seas that I want to dig into is less of a legacy and more of a constant throughout history. Corruption. It tends to be a buzzword that people understand to mean stealing or being dishonest in various different ways. And that's most definitely part of it. But it's the implications of it that we really need to focus on. Corruption can happen in various different ways, both strictly within the government sector as well as involving the private sector too. It's often depicted as officials blatantly stealing from the government's coffers. But there's a bit more nuance to it. That construction project that should have been done two years ago that still feels like it's a few years away from completion, there were probably a few people who took a cut out of the budget. That new legislation that sounds like it would surely only serve to benefit a small section of society, it was probably funded or influenced by them in some way or another. The approval of a new food or drug that most of the world seems to have banned, but one country in particular decides that it's good enough to approve, there's definitely a few people making money from that. The thing about corruption is that it's a buzzword that people like to throw around when speaking about some of the problems that poor states have. And yes, it is something that runs rampant. But at the same time, you have to look at it comparatively. $1 billion magically going missing from Sudan with a $34 billion GDP is a huge chunk of the country's whole economy. Whereas $1 billion going missing in the UK's $3 trillion GDP is simply a VC or private equity project gone wrong. When the pot to spend on government programs, infrastructure, and essential services like healthcare and education is smaller, the whole country suffers. 
but it's especially the poorer states and specifically the poorer people within those states that tend to be impacted the most. Unless the incentives are strong enough to stop people from engaging in corruption, there's no reason why the vast majority would. Corruption is a systemic problem, but it's not exclusive to poor countries. It may have more of an impact and take a bigger toll on the population, but don't think that it's an exclusive trait that doesn't impact the rich world. Whenever the incentives to deter people from being corrupt are not strong enough, you best believe that people are out there making money, channeling their influence and receiving favors to steer society in certain directions, regardless of where that country is. Colonialism, the Cold War, and corruption are all very important chapters and footnotes in the history books of pretty much every poor country on Earth. But they don't tell the full story. There are also some surface level reasons worth exploring to explain why some countries are poor today. A really interesting place to start is the correlation between a country's average temperature and their GDP. The guys at Economics Explained have a great video about the topic that I'll leave linked in the description, and I got some really interesting takeaways from it. If you look at the great empires of antiquity, many of them were situated in much hotter regions of the world. The Mayans, the Egyptians, and the Aztecs all had great empires in hotter regions of the world. Nowadays though, it tends to be an exception to the rule to have a rich country in warmer weather. The explanation they gave, which I found really interesting, was that with colder weather, people were forced to build more stable structures, both in terms of society as well as physical buildings which allowed them to cope with the harsher conditions of the winter more easily. Since it was usually good all year round to build, hunt, and farm in warmer weathers, civilizations in these kinds of regions didn't really have to build these kinds of structures as robustly. In colder countries, this compounded over centuries to foster more cooperation between people and to have them value capital goods more. Then, when you chart those trajectories up to the start of the age of European exploration and when these nations started to become richer from resources from the Americas, you can start to see how they already had the basis to build up strong societies. Some people like to think that climate really makes a difference because when it's hotter, people like to be outside and enjoy themselves more. Whereas when it's cold and dark for half the year, people are more likely to stay inside and actually build and develop something. Although that theory does make sense, Hot weather makes people lazy isn't a particularly great, never mind useful explanation to the question of why some countries are poor whereas others are rich. Sometimes, even more than the climate itself, it's the country's geography that actually determines its fate. You can take this in many ways, and all of them tend to have outliers regardless of where you look. Mountainous terrains, flat plains, navigable rivers, vast oceans, fertile land, and rainfall in different regions have all shaped the world throughout history, as Tim Marshall explains brilliantly in his book, Prisoners of Geography. Over the last 200, and especially the last 60 years though, I would argue that the main geographic factors that need to be considered are more so where the country is physically located. Take Saudi Arabia for example, which just happened to be located atop of the world's second largest petroleum reserves and managed to use that money wisely to actually be able to develop itself. Or even look at Singapore, which was once a fisherman's village, which then turned into one of the prime financial centers in all of Asia. This was because of excellent leadership, but equally because of the fact that it happened to be placed in an excellent location at the heart of one of the world's most important trade routes by the Malacca Strait. On the other hand, just look at the sheer amount of countries in the world that found oil within their territory and didn't manage to play their cards right, either crumbling to their knees like Venezuela or getting a dose of freedom from the American military in places like Iraq or Libya. Even in terms of where they're located, just take a look at a country like Hungary, which was once part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, which was one of Europe's great powers. Having become part of the Soviet Union's sphere of influence after World War II and had communism forced on them, despite their resistance, for the best part of 50 years, their GDP per capita today is still 41% lower than Austria's, even though they're a slightly larger country and have been in the EU for about 20 years. Climate and geography are huge factors in the story of any state. They're the cars that every country is handed and they are passed down from generation to generation. It would be way too simplistic to just point at these reasons and say those are the ones why countries are poor though. And there are deeper, more significant factors that we ultimately need to consider.
as we start to look at some of the deeper points of what makes some countries poor, we need to turn back to what we were saying about colonialism earlier and really put that into context with the institutions that remain as a legacy of it. The impact of colonialism was different depending on the type of colonialism that was actually there, as we explored with the settler versus extractive colonies. The truth is, the majority of colonies were set up in an extractive way, and even some of the settler colonies ended up being abandoned in their project nation building once independence came to the fore. And the majority of these, regardless of the empire they belonged to, had very similar characteristics in the ways that they were set up. These economies tended to be geared towards making the colonies nothing more than a supplier of raw materials. Since manufacturing was what brought nations true wealth for the majority of the 19th and 20th centuries, the countries that controlled territories would keep all the manufacturing in their homeland, simply importing the raw materials from the colonies in order to keep the production line going. This meant that the colonies never actually produced their own manufactured goods. They were just the geese that laid the golden eggs. A society like that was never geared towards producing entrepreneurs, intellectuals, businesses, or even to develop the living standards of the people there. They were instead set up in a very hierarchical social structure, where there tended to be one strongman in power with direct ties to the capital of the empire, a small elite that oversaw the day-to-day -day running of the colony, and the large majority of the population working to essentially serve their interests. Power was centralized in the head of the state, and the majority of the population tended to be employed in industries that provided raw materials. Of course, each state was different and each empire had their own administration that would differ slightly, but the general structures of power tended to be the same. Many of these colonies, particularly in the Americas, imported slaves to do work, while in many others, it was the local population that were put to work, oftentimes becoming economically enslaved to the empire through taxation as was the case with the Indian subcontinent during British rule. Further yet, if there were revolts or rebellions in these states, it was common to see forceful repression, either by local military or police groups that had been set up, or in more extreme cases from armies being shipped in directly from the capitals of the empires overseas. By painting this picture of the shared colonial experience, you can see why some countries in Latin America, Africa, and Asia all have a shared colonial past and shared characteristics that live through to this day. The model of strongman in charge, wealthy elite, usually there through inheritance, strong presence of the military, large sections of the population being undereducated and poor, and poor quality of general infrastructure is a shared experience. These were set up at a time when these countries were extractive colonies, and many of them operate still under the same model. They tend to primarily be export-heavy economies with limited manufacturing capability and an inability to build lasting democratic states with institution and a coherent state planning project with any goal aside from enriching the elites or keeping the leader in power. Beyond just the institutions and the social structures that these countries have in common, there tends to be a further problem that they all share with each other. I once had a friend tell me that the primary reasons why countries don't develop past their current state is out of a lack of incentives. And that was a moment for me where the way I started seeing not just the direction of countries but the people who make up that system in a different light. Incentives can come in one of two forms, either carrots or sticks. Carrots are the things that incentivize people to act in certain ways, whereas sticks are the things that incentivize them not to do certain other things. On a purely economic level, a carrot could be a subsidy that you could place on a particular item that would encourage people to buy more because the price has dropped, whereas a stick could come in the form of a tax that would make an item more expensive and then discourage people to consume more of it. On the government level, this ends up translating not just to the type of people that come into office, but also what those people do once they're in there. And those incentives don't tend to be aligned with the greater good, especially when it comes to poorer countries. In order to get into power, the people running tend to need to get support from different factions of the government. In exchange for their support, they're expected to return all kinds of favors or to side with them on different issues, which could lead to campaign promises not being delivered. Usually, it just means that the leaders that are backed by the most money, which comes with the most strings and interests attached, are the ones that end up winning these elections. 
those in the positions to help out elected leaders come into power tend to have vested interests in policies that aren't necessarily the best for the general population and tend to be favorable to their own interests regardless of what would be best for the nation. People that could actually have good ideas and the means to implement them might just see that, see the game that's being played, and decide that their time isn't best served actually playing them. If you look at the system as a whole in the majority of underdeveloped countries, with layers of bureaucracy, corrupt officials, and vested interests from different powers that be, you can understand why a lot of the smartest and brightest in society decide that it isn't a game worth playing. More than that, sometimes a lot of them will decide that the country isn't even one worth living in, which just leads to a further problem. When you have a country that doesn't offer opportunities to its citizens, a lot of them will accept their fate and stay there suffering, whereas others will decide to pack their bags and try their luck elsewhere. This applies to people doing basic jobs, like cleaners for example, that can realize that they can make a better living for themselves by leaving the country to earn in a stronger currency and send it back home to support their families. More crucially for the country's prospects of actually improving their situation, however, is that the best and brightest might just go and live a better life in a different country. This ends up having a huge impact on the country, not just in the short term, but also in the long term. These people are not only the most likely to be earning the most money so that they can spend it on the economy and even pay in taxes, but they're also the type of people that could probably make a difference within the government itself. Even more than that in the long run, their kids might end up growing up somewhere that isn't their home country and ending up identifying more with that country than their own. If they stay out for more than a couple of generations, these new generations are already completely assimilated into their new country and will more than often not have any intention of coming back and actually making a difference. There will always be exceptions to the rule. Some countries will be able to break through their cycle of poverty and really begin to prosper, whereas others might look like they have every advantage in the world and still fail to kick on. Ultimately, circumstances, history, and people also play a role. Where could Russia be if they had never turned communist? Would Singapore have ever been capable of being where it is today if it weren't for the leadership of Lee Kuan Yew? Where would China, and the rest of the world for that matter, be if they had been better prepared to defend themselves and explore their own interests abroad before the century of humiliation? Trends, commonalities, and patterns are all very useful to explore how countries got to where they are today, and explain why the world is how it is. Ultimately though, the pages of history are defined by the small moments and the individuals who set things in certain directions. And as with most things in life, you only really get a chance to collect your fruit years after the seeds have been planted. Argentina, for example, is one of, if not the most unique case study of a country as an underachiever compared to its potential. And that's one video that I really look forward to diving into here on this channel down the line. On that matter, if you've enjoyed this video so far and you've taken something away from it, don't forget to like this video, leave a comment below to let me know what you think or if you think I've missed anything, and don't forget to subscribe to keep up to date with the content that we have coming up, where we'll be diving into different countries, different people, life lessons, and looking at the world at large. To wrap it up then, why is it that the majority of poor countries tend to stay poor? World history and the empires of antiquity have much less to say about where the country is currently at compared to the more recent exploits of the past. With the advent of colonialism and the Cold War, play very important roles in the stories of how countries go to where they are today, and they will play a much bigger role than the distant past. There are also more surface level reasons like climate or geography, and although these can play big roles, they'll ultimately be a smaller piece of a much larger puzzle. Corruption, which is often the thing that people will point at first when speaking about why poor countries stay poor, is a common trait in governments around the world regardless of their economic situation. It plays a bigger role in poorer countries because there's less money to go around. That should never be the sole focus of any kind of analysis on this topic. More than anything, it's the deeper reasons we looked at that have played and continue to play a role in why these countries stay poor. Institutions and social structures from colonial times often mean that these countries are stuck in export-driven economies that ultimately benefit only a select few. They favor certain interests and that ends up facilitating corruption at the highest level. On top of that, the incentive structures within the countries 
are normally not aligned to get the best people in power, nor are they aligned to actually get the best out of people. There tend to be few consequences for acting in bad faith and no real benefit to working out long-term, nation-building projects as opposed to short-term things that will keep them in power. That just leads to short-term thinking that doesn't compound over time and ends up holding these countries back. These long-term problems with no real end in sight just lead to the best and brightest people who would have ideally been able to make a difference in society moving elsewhere, giving the countries even fewer routes out of their current situation. Of course, there are always exceptions, and there will be countries that end up restructuring, getting their affairs in order, and making big strides in their development. Each country is different, and even within the reasons I mentioned, certain countries will be impacted more by some factors, whereas others may have completely different sets of long-standing reasons that have kept them down. Equally, there is no uniform path to prosperity, and it's up to each individual country to find their combination of things that will allow them to flourish. Hope you've gotten some insights from this and that it may have given you some points to consider. Don't forget to drop a like below if you enjoyed this video and leave a comment to let me know what you thought. From here on out, I'll be digging into specific countries to look at how they got to where they are today, the different chapters in their history, and really the main lessons that we can draw from each of their situations. If that's of interest to you, don't forget to subscribe to keep up to date with some of the videos coming your way. We're still just getting started and there is a whole lot more to come. I'll see you next time.